As we speak, majority control in Congress is still an open question. Counting in a handful of districts is still underway nationally. All seven South Florida members of Congress representing Broward and Miami-Dade and Monroe counties were easily reelected. Repping the southernmost district, South Dade, through the Keys, Carlos Jimenez won a third term. The Miami Republican serves on Homeland Security and Armed Services Committees. One of the President-elect Trump's most vocal South Florida supporters right there with us live today via Zoom. Congressman, good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm good. Congratulations on your reelection. Thank you. I appreciate it. So um, I want to keep the focus a bit local for us. We are a local program. As you enter your third term, your party leader is returning to the presidency. How, give me the headlines, how does that affect South Florida, do you think? I think it affects uh, South Florida uh, positively in a number of ways. Look, the, the president has said that we need to bring down prices, uh, bring down inflation. We need to bring down energy costs, uh, the cost of gasoline. We need to be respected around the world. Uh, and so I believe that uh, it'll 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 be good for South Florida. Obviously, uh, he's uh, he is from South Florida. He's from Palm Beach, and uh, and also he has a number of supporters, you know, uh, that uh, that helped him during his campaign. So I would expect that South Florida, Florida in general, and the nation in general is going to do much better. I, I want to talk a little bit about, I mean, this was a fair, untainted election. The votes were counted. Nothing was stolen. Mm -hmm. Uh, Vice President Harris conceded the Biden administration is inviting President-elect Trump for a collaborative transition. I, you agree with that? So far, so good, right? So far, so good, yeah. <laughs> I want you to, I mean, you know, we, I've had the pleasure of knowing you in such several roles that you've had locally, nonpartisan roles, and I really think you are a really great voice to speak to the concerns and the fears. I mean, we were at the election night in, in Palm Beach. There were people I talked to, there was such joy there. There was, I will say, a sense of relief there among President, former President Trump's, President-elect Trump's, what do we call him now? President-elect Trump's supporters. Uh, pres but President Trump, <laughs> President-elect Trump. I mean, both, right? It's kind of it's kind of that interesting guy. that it's, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> the once and future president. You know, there yeah. are there are real fears and real concerns uh, from his opposition, from our friends and neighbors who did not vote for him because of some of the things that he said and because of his rhetoric. And, and I'd love you to speak to them today and, well, speak to, I'm not gonna put words in your mouth, speak to them and, oh, and let them know uh, it's sure. coming. Oh, uh, look, some of the people say he's gonna be a dictator from, uh, from day one. That was com take, taken completely out of context. Somebody asked him, hey, if you were a dictator for one day, what would you do, okay? He didn't well, say he wanted me, to be a dictator. Let me okay? just, I, so, I think I've got the yeah. quote. The quote was, I'm not yeah. going to be a dictator except on day one. I think that was the direct quote. No, I don't think, well, that the question was if you were a dictator for one day. So look, he's not going to be a dictator, first of all, because it, it takes uh, more than one person to be a dictator. It means that we, Congress, is going to allow him to be a dictator, and that's not going to happen, okay? Mm -hmm. And so he doesn't want to be a dictator. Uh, he... You know, he was com taken completely out of context and uh, we're going to the, the country's going to be just fine. You know, we, we are Republicans. Hopefully we have the Senate. Hopefully we'll have the House We have a, a very big agenda that we want to pass. But it's going to be passed, you know, uh, through the normal process uh, with Congress passing laws and the president signing laws. Now, the president does have pretty, pretty large and vast, you know, executive powers. You know, I mean. What happened at the border? The Congress didn't pass any different laws con con you know, pertaining to immigration, and yet you had the borders were pretty well controlled under President Trump, and then they were they ran amok under President Biden. Why? Due to the executive orders, and so the the president has a lot of power now. Congress uh, is going to is our job is to watch the administration uh, and make sure make sure that they're doing what we want them to do. And so that's that's what's going to happen. So this whole thing about him being a dictator, that's that's complete hooey. I understand that some people might be afraid of it, but I'm telling you, those those fears are completely unfounded. So let's um, I'm glad you brought up the border because I, I really want to drill into a little bit of that, because that is such a South Florida story as well as a national concern. Mm -hmm. and, and it was so interesting when we were in Des Moines, Iowa in January, Iowa voters spontaneously would say their top two issues were the economy and the border, which I think I was surprised by a, a northern snowy state having that yeah. as their top. But let's talk about what one of the things that 
um, President-elect Trump had said was, on day one, I'm going to do the ma uh, something about the biggest mass deportation. That was one of the day one quotes. And, you know, in fairness, if there is going to be deportation of people who aren't going to be here, no one can refute that that's not a positive thing. However, who should be here and who should not is a very complicated equation. And so in, in a South Florida sense, and I want to drill down really into uh, some of this, what do you see happening? What is the biggest mass deportation on day one do you think look like? You can't have mass deportations on day one, I'll tell you that right now, okay? It's not going to happen, all right? So um, what's going to happen on day one is that President Trump is going to sign a number of executive orders that reinstituting his policies that were so successful in really stemming the flow of illegal immigration into this country. Uh, on day one, President Biden undid many of those policies, and that's what caused the flood of immigrants to come into the country. There's two things that are going to happen. Number one, he's going to sign that. The second thing is that the word is going to get down uh, into those countries that are trying, that, that are sending people here or the people themselves said, hey, you know, this is, uh, it's not the same. Don't even try it. So you're going to see less immigrants try to come into the country just by that. The border policy will change. He's going to make some phone calls to the president of Mexico and um, and say there's a couple of things that I want him to do to, 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 to say. Number one. Your cartels are killing tens of thousands of our American citizens, and that has to stop, like right now. Uh, second, those same cartels are making billions of dollars in human trafficking, many of which are minors. Uh, many of those minors, we don't know where they are right now in the United States. Uh, they're being sex trafficked, slave trafficked in the United States. That has to stop right now. Or if not, we're going to take some uh, some economic actions against your country, and uh, and we need to restore the stay in Mexico policy. So that, start, that is starting to stem the flow of the immigrants. Now, what happens to the people that are here? Every one of those folks has due process rights, which means that they have to have their day in court. I would expect, I would expect that the president is going to hire a, a large number of immigration officers, judges, so that they can actually adjudicate these cases. Remember, uh, Glenna, if you come, if you are encountered at the, at the border and you have an asylum claim, you're supposed there's one of two things is supposed to happen to you. You're either supposed to stay in a third country, which was what's happening with with Remain in Mexico, or you're supposed to be detained inside the United States unless you're given parole. But parole is supposed to be done on a case by case basis. The Biden administration did it on a mass basis. So these folks are all paroled into the United States, but they all have a court hearing. We have to accelerate those court hearings, so, so and then when I, yeah, so okay, so saying, that they I'm, get I'm their sorry, day in court. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah. I, I'm just, I, I just want to put a headline on that. What I'm hearing is there will not be any suspension of immigration law; rather, um, managing what is happening in a more expeditious way. Would would that be what I'm hearing? I w that's that's certainly what I would do. I don't think that you can uh, deny people their due process. Okay, and so. Uh, you're going to be tied in courts if you if you try to do anything else. Right, so sorry. you need to accelerate that process. And then those folks that have valid asylum claims get to stay in the United States because that's what the law says. Those that don't, they are deported back to their country because you know what? That's what the law says. So we just have to follow the law. Um, I want to take a, a quick break up against a commercial break. There's a couple of other immigration and immigrant related questions for you when we come okay. back. All right. We are back with newly re-elected Congressman Carlos Jimenez, Republican from Miami, talking about immigration and Trump transition. And you're going to see him in hopefully just a minute. Hello. <laughs> I know, Congressman, you, you can't see what I'm looking at, but um, I'm just kind of talking us through it. So I, okay. I want to just get back. <laughs> I want to get back to a couple of other details under the umbrella that we talk about migrants and immigration. It's so important in South Florida. Two things. I'll ask them both at the same time and you can run with those. Um, a real fear, especially in the agriculture and service industries, that the labor force that is migrant workers, many times seasonal workers, many times not all that legal here, uh, will really have an effect on the Florida economy. Number two, the people who are here under deferred action, 
who were brought very young with their parents who are here by by no uh, means of their own but who are essentially Americans grown up here went to school here work here uh, and and now their status may hang in the balance to you look uh, I, th I think what we're going to do is uh, we're going to concentrate on the people that just came in in the last three and a half years I mean this this flood of illegal immigrants that came in through the Biden Harris administration something north of 10 million people. Those aren't the people that were working in the, in the fields. Uh, those people have been here for some time. The problem with Biden and Harris and, and what they did, by completely obliterating the, the southern border and allowing tens of millions of people in, in, they've stopped all the debate about what's going to happen with those other illegals that have been here for a number of years and what's ha going to happen with those those kids that, that, uh, that were brought here and they basically lived all their life here. You know, uh, so the we have to take care of these this blood that came in first, and then we can start having that debate about how we're going to bring those other folks that have been here for a number of years out of the light. How can we can get them to to pay taxes, et cetera, and and uh, make you know they're already part of the economy, and then bring them out in, in, in a way that that yes, uh, they can can work, yes, they can stay, but. Uh, their pathway to citizenship, you know, some people say there's a pathway to citizenship. I say that for those, they need to go, they don't have to go back physically back to their country, but they need to get in the back of the line of their country uh, because there's quotas for each of those countries. And sometimes they're going to become citizens, sometimes they won't become citizens. But I, th that's not what we're going to be focusing in on uh, at the beginning here. We're going to be focusing in on the tens of millions that have come in through the the, the, the Biden Harris time. That's the ones that uh, that we need to really focus in. If they have a valid asylum claim, they can stay. If they don't, they need to get deported back to their country. So do you foresee you and your colleagues in Congress taking up uh, again some kind of comprehensive immigration bill like your colleague Maria Salazar, Miami Republican, has her dignity bill, which we've discussed here in the show. There's there have been you know decades worth of attempts in South Florida Congress people are so involved in that. What do you see coming up? I think the only chance that we can get to that, and I would hope that we do, is that we control the border and we show the American people that uh, we have now restored. You know we have a, a a legal immigration system that we have stopped illegal immigration into the United States, and then. You can have that debate. You can have that discussion about those that have been here for a long, long time, uh, such as what Maria's bill is, is about. There are a lot of things about Maria's bill I like. There are some things I may disagree with. I don't believe there should be an automatic pathway to citizenship. I don't think they, they should. Uh, anybody who's been here should get jump in front of uh, the line of those that have tried to come here the right way from those countries. I think they need to get to the back of the line of those countries. Uh, but I don't believe that the, I personally don't believe that they should be deported, especially since they, the ones that have been here a, a long, long time and they're a part of our economy. We need to have that discussion, but you can't have that discussion until we secure the border. And that's uh, that's really the, the tragedy of the Biden and the Harris administration and their policy of open borders have really destroyed and really hurt those people that have been here for a long time. Uh, and and are any efforts to try to get them, you know, out into the light and give them some some sort of legality. I, I want to, in the last couple of minutes that we have together, I want to sort of drill down into your district, um, and which is the Keys and South Dade on the front lines of rising seas, and whether yeah. you believe rising seas are for man-made or evolutionary, they are rising, and that's science. Um, and then there's drill baby drill, and that was part of the priority agenda for the incoming president. And I want yeah. to get your take on having some sort of, I know the, the Green New Deal is probably off the table for national Republicans, but I want to really get um, sort of what your common sense vision is for what people can do in your district and nationally uh, going forward in, to be resilient in the face of sea level rise. Well, I'll tell you the best way to reduce uh, carbon emissions, which, by the way, that's carbon dioxide. All right, uh, the best way to do that is by replacing Chinese coal with American natural gas, and you can reduce carbon emissions by fifty percent, like that. So uh, this whole thing of us, uh, you know, it's going. We're 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 buying Chinese technology, 
which is the solar panels and the wind and the wind turbines. The Chinese aren't using them. They're just selling it to us so that we can become dependent on them for energy. That's crazy. What we need to do is make them dependent on us for, for energy. They, they, for every single pound of carbon dioxide that we reduce here in the United States, they, are, they increase it by twice that amount. So the seas are rising. The seas have risen and fallen for all time. Now, we can get into a debate on what's causing that, okay? Regardless, it's happening. So you're going to have to take, take, you know, you have to take that in consideration. And we have to remediate for it, and we have to adjust to it, um, because I don't think whatever we do, it's going to stop it, because it's been going up and down for a long, long time. Look, 40,000 years ago, the seas were 400 feet well, shallower. So they've been rising for the last 40,000 years. So, so what we have to do is we have to make America energy, not energy independent, energy dominant so that we can substitute American oil and gas for Russian oil and gas, Iranian oil and gas, and Venezuelan oil and gas. And why those three? Because those are trying to establish the new world order. They're the ones that are giving China a break on their energy prices uh, at, the, at the expense of our allies and the United States. The fact that we can supply all our allies and we can supply the needs of the world because we have the largest reserves in the world means that we should be using it to, A, for strategic purposes and also to reduce our national debt and our balance of, of trade. So the fact that the Biden administration tried to kill our energy industry is, again, another sign that he, he was completely off base uh, with what he was trying to do, certainly not in American interest. The reason that Iran was able to fund Hezbollah and Hamas and the Houthis is because they are able to sell 500 500% more of their oil uh, during the Biden administration. They got all that revenue so that they could help create chaos in the Middle East. That has to stop. President Trump is absolutely right. We have we have liquid gold underneath our, our feet and gas, and we should be using it to, uh, to drive American interest, drive our prices down. And when you drive energy costs down in the United States, you also drive costs of uh, inflation down because Everything is tied to, to energy. Uh, and so he was absolutely right. And we're going to support President Trump's efforts to uh, to build up American energy. Congressman Carlos Jimenez, always great to have you on the program. And I know this is the first of many more in your third term when that starts. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks so much. Take care.